Okay, hello everybody, I'm Keith Krause. I'm also with the Airborne Observation Platform team, and I'm gonna kinda take what Tristan did and go a little more advanced. And I'm gonna keep this presentation a little shorter than probably the number of slides I have. So fortunately, Tristan covered several of my slides already. And uh, um, I'm gonna try to introduce a little more LIDAR theory because it's kinda in the context that hopefully will make sense of why maybe our waveform data looks the way it does. And uh, you know, hopefully that'll make sense. And also talk a little bit more about, you know, you ask questions about, you know, target detection and that sort of thing. So some of that's gonna come up a little more in the waveform. Uh, Tristan already kind of showed you, you know, discrete LIDAR. You're essentially finding sort of returns or objects. You get geolocation, so that could be X, Y, Z on a map. Intensity, other attributes, um, and that's great. But the hope is with full waveform LIDAR, you're actually measuring that entire signal as a function of time. So the hope is that you can do more with that data. And we'll talk a little more about that. Um, one of the challenges in the past is that full waveform LIDAR data just hasn't been available to people. So there's a handful of groups that are working with it right now, but you don't typically see lots of papers or presentations on the subject. And we're hoping to change that. And at the current moment, we have LiDAR products from some of our 2013 and 2014 flights, and that's available by request. Unfortunately, we weren't able to collect any waveform data last year due to some instrument hardware issues, uh, but we've been collecting it this year in 2016, and we're currently processing that data, so it should be coming available, hopefully, in the next couple weeks. And as I mentioned, we hope more people get involved with waveform LiDAR. So these are just some more graphical representations of what you've already seen from Tristan. Uh, but I think the big thing in terms of waveform LIDAR and what I'm gonna talk about, just keep in mind, right, once again, you have this outgoing laser pulse, some time goes by, and then you're able to record some reflection of light as a function of time. And we're gonna keep kind of coming back to this change in time. Uh, this is just another form of one of the figures Tristan showed. Uh, but from Texas A&M and Dr. Soren Papaskiu. Um, we're gonna zoom a little more into this plot here in a second. But yeah, once again, remember it's a 2D beam that's interacting with objects as a function of time. And keep in mind with LiDAR, time is distance, distance is time. And so you have discrete return and full waveform. Uh, discrete return, there's usually onboard processing that real time will look at that signal and try to do target detection, and then it does the ranging. And in Soren's figure, he kind of talks about this idea that depending on what sort of algorithm or hardware is used, there could be a period of time where it detects an object, and then it might have to reset itself so it can actually miss things. And the nice thing about the full waveform is you'll capture this entire signal as a function of time so hopefully with post-processing, you can go in and get more detail. But as you'll see in a minute, there are some complications too. And the hope is looking at these waveforms, you know, just like with discrete data, you could start to maybe imagine based on the way the tree structure is that you might have overstory and some understory and maybe the ground. And you can start thinking about stratification of either vegetation or other objects. i um, not gonna spend too much time here, but just the general process of LIDAR is, you know, you fire your laser, you record your signal, you do some sort of target detection. Uh, basically, once you've identified a target, you can then look at the change in time between that outgoing pulse and the received pulse. Uh, you do some calculations, that converts that time of flight into a range. Then from the range, uh, you know, you have your GPS IMU and you can figure out what direction the scan mirror is pointed at, and then that gets you your coordinates. So just like discrete return points can have geolocation, full waveforms can too, and you'll see with the product that we include geolocation information. Um, in general, uh, ranging you know, follows kind of the basic uh, speed of light calculations from, I don't know, a couple hundred years ago. But essentially, in this case, we know the speed of light, but you have the speed of light, you have a change in time between that outgoing and return pulse. Remember, the light has to travel there and then also come back, so the distance is actually half of that time. And then, of course, um, you have the index of refraction of air, 
because that laser light's actually gonna slow down a little bit traveling in air than say it would in space if you were in a vacuum. So that's just that absolute range. You might also hear the term of range resolution, and some people call this different, but Tristan kind of mentioned, you know, when objects get too close to each other, you can't resolve them anymore, and I'll show a figure of that. But essentially, that's gonna be driven by the outgoing pulse shape, so these laser pulses don't infinitely or infinitesimally jump up to a peak signal. You know, it does take time for it to kind of ramp up, fire that laser, and then ramp back down. And so that shape will actually cause blurring, and that's why you can't detect objects. So there are several different algorithms for how you would do ranging, and uh, different manufacturers will use their different proprietary algorithms. I'm just going to show one of the really simple ones. So you can imagine if you have your outgoing laser pulse, then some time goes by, it reflects off, in this case, probably the ground, since you just get a single peak. We're going to find the peaks, and then in this case, we're going to say, well, let's go and figure out where the 50% energy is on the left side. And so this would be called leading edge detection. That's done in this case mostly because if you look at the shape of this outgoing pulse, it actually is kind of pushed more onto the right side, so it's not perfectly Gaussian. So combination of you have a sharper kind of rise, then you do a fall. And then the other piece is, you know, this is the ground, so it's pretty simple, but if you're interacting with the canopy, you can imagine that left edge is gonna be the top of the canopy. So that might be where you actually wanna range to. And I guess one other thing to note, so yeah, so the time between the outgoing pulse and the return pulse ends up being about 6,500 nanoseconds. Um, when you do all the conversion, that comes out to about, in this case, 983 meters. So you can imagine if we're trying to fly at about 1,000 meters above the ground, you have some terrain variation, and there you get 983. So, you know, this may address your question a little bit, but you can see just with discrete and waveform, you might get multiple peaks. So in this case, you could identify three objects, and each of them has a leading edge. And so you could identify in the discrete return three targets. And if you were just looking at the relative time difference between these, maybe you could say this is the ground and this is the canopy top, and in this case, the canopy would be 14 meters tall. So you can start to see that might be one way that you might analyze waveform data is rather than building a canopy height model on a raster grid, you might be able to identify canopies and ground within a single laser pulse and now start looking at distance measurements that way. So a little more on range resolution and target separation. This hopefully illustrates what Tristan talked about. In this case, I've just done a simulation and we're using a 10 nanosecond outgoing pulse, which is typical of the Optech system. Think at 70 kilohertz, and 100 kilohertz might be a little wider, so it actually blur more. But you can see in this case, if you have a 10 nanosecond wide Gaussian, and you take two kind of ideal targets and put them 40 nanoseconds away from each other, clearly you can see two peaks, and that's easy. Um, if you move them closer, you can see that the signal starts to blend in the middle, but you can still identify them. And even here, no problem. But you can see here, if you actually separate them by exactly one of the full width half maxes, you know, to you and I, we still see kind of a double peak, but actually a lot of algorithms might have a hard time trying to determine exactly where those two peaks are, and it might still say that there's one peak. And as you get below, you know, if you get less than the full width half max, you still had two targets in the original, but you can see the signal actually sums into a single shape. So at this point, you've effectively lost your ability to say that there's definitely two objects there. Could just be one object that was brighter. And as you go even further, same kind of thing. And you'll see if we put some actual Gaussians on this, at least in this case, if you had a really sensitive algorithm, you might say that I only have one object, but it's not a perfect Gaussian, so maybe there's something else there. But at this point, at half the full width half max, you'd probably have no way of knowing that there's two objects. So that's kind of the idea of range resolution. So you can imagine different branches in a tree. If they're too close together, their signal's just gonna sum up and it's gonna look like just one big branch. <laughs> 
I'm not going to talk too much about this other than I do have a figure to kind of explain this. But one of the challenges with all these systems is being able to write the data fast enough to keep up. So kind of as a comparison, the hyperspectral data, you have a 640 by 480 array, you're running it at 100 lines per second, and that's effectively equivalent to the data rate that the LiDAR runs at at 100 kilohertz if we had 310 time bins that we were trying to save out. Now the difference is the spectrometer has a fancy computer and I think it simultaneously writes to four hard drives at the same time, whereas the LiDAR I think has a single hard drive. So there's kind of games you have to play uh, making sure you're saving out that data fast enough or else the laser's gonna keep firing and you'll just miss everything. Um, so as an example, you know, you might love to save the entire data space from when you fire that outgoing laser all the way through the air down to the ground and back. Uh, but unfortunately, that would be over 6,000 bins of data. And just with uh, 100 kilohertz, which is our nominal PRF, and if we had 8-bit data, let's say, which most of the newer systems are running higher than that, like 16 bits, um, you'd actually need to write out at about 5 gigabits per second. Um, now, the other day I just copied some data from a hard drive and it was running at like 30 megabits per second. So you can imagine, you know, it's orders of magnitude, so you just can't save everything. So there's some solutions to that, which we're going to talk about, which is multiple segments. We don't save all the data. Um, the challenges are you have to set a threshold. If you set that threshold too high, you'll miss stuff. If you set it too low, things like just haze in the atmosphere could trigger the LIDAR, and a lot of times they'll limit how many bins you can save, so you might burn up that entire space and not even get close to the ground. So this is just kind of an example of how the multiple segment works. Um, this is a simulated waveform over here. Maybe we set a threshold at 50 dNs. You can see anything that's above, you know, would definitely be triggered as a target. We might also buffer it a little bit, so that's kind of where these green lines are. But you can see here, we've totally missed this low signal peak. And when we save out the waveform data, it's just gone and we never knew it existed. And this is just one more example where I move that center feature over a little bit. So you'll see this a lot of times in our waveforms where, you know, you'd say, oh, well, there must still be something here, but unfortunately, you've lost that data. So that's something you can't recover unless we were to go and drop that threshold and try to recreate the data. Another thing that you'll see is it's digital data. We have to sample it onto some time bin. So we'll actually do a digitization to one nanoseconds. Now, based on those kind of range resolution type numbers, that still applies here. One nanoseconds is about 15 centimeters. So we're saving the data in 15 centimeter range bins. Uh, but some of the ranging target algorithms, they can do better than that. So you can get higher absolute precision. Uh, but what happens is, you know, if you have a wide outgoing pulse here with the raw kind of simulation and digitized, you can see it still looks pretty much like the original. But with the newer systems, they're taking those pulse widths, making them really short, because what that does is that gives us more 3D structure resolution. But you can see when you put this onto a one nanosecond grid, now you start to get funny kind of triangles and flat tops and other weird artifacts. So essentially, if you were just working with this raw data by itself, you might run into errors. Uh, so a lot of the algorithms in processing will actually go and fit this with some sort of a shape that maybe is on a higher resolution and can recreate where the actual peaks are. And then you'll see there's also noise. Some of that could just be you know, electronic noise in the system. Or in some cases, you know, remember, even though the laser is at 1064 nanometers and they try to kind of hold the receiver to only see that wavelength, the sun is reflecting off of trees at 1064 nanometers. So that'll actually cause sort of an overall bias that might raise the signal up. And, you know, so that might be something you want to look at, like an offset and do some relative scaling. Uh, just really quick on our product, right now it's a series of binary files. Uh, we have the outgoing pulses, we have the return waveforms. We also provide geolocation information. So essentially I've gone and geolocated what I think the first return is, but then also provided other information to be able to transfer that to any other bin in the waveform. 
We also provide some observation information, so that's viewing geometry, distances. Um, and then finally, we provide some ephemeris data of the GPS and IMU. So the hope was, even though we're doing the geolocation ourselves, if somebody really wanted to go kind of back to the beginning and recreate it all, they have hopefully all the information they need to do rigorous calculations. And then finally, there's also some QC files. So essentially, they're just point clouds that were derived from the waveform so that we know if it worked or not. So if there was some big bug in my processing code, we would see it where it might not map things on the ground correctly. And you can see this is just kind of what the waveform product looks like. So you have your laser pulse number on the vertical. You have outgoing pulses. So this is its own data array. You have return waveforms as their own data array. And if we just grab one horizontal slice out of here, so this is just one laser pulse, you can see you get a waveform with multiple peaks. And this is a good example where, you know, if you were just looking at peaks, you'd say, oh, well, there's four peaks. But like my algorithm actually can't do the leading edge on this guy, so it'll say, well, I know there's something here, but I don't know how to geolocate it, so sorry. Um, the other thing that I want to use this slide for is to say some of the power of the waveform is you can see how there's kind of these bumps going on, sometimes on the right. So you have light interacting with the canopy, and there's photons doing multiple scattering, and they kind of get delayed a little bit. And so with waveform, you might actually be able to take advantage of this, whereas all that information is just thrown away in the discrete LIDAR. Going to skip over geolocation stuff. You can see different targets make different shapes, but it's not like very straightforward. It's not like, oh, well, a conifer tree is always going to look like this. So even though this is a nice example, the real world's never as nice. Um, but you can see bare soil is pretty much a hard target. So the return waveform is going to look very much like the outgoing pulse shape. Uh, different trees, uh, deciduous trees might have more reflection off, say, the top, whereas a conifer with its cone shape, you're going to have more photons coming later from lower levels in the tree. Um, in some cases, like a pine plantation where they've cut down several of the trees, you'll have a beam that'll hit part of a tree, but then it also hits the ground. So you can see a strong ground return, but also some vegetation. Um, just once again, power of waveform. Here are four different plots of what might only come out as a single return in the discrete data, but you can see the shapes are very different from each other. So the hope is that with waveform LIDAR, this information can be extracted. And I'm just going to show one quick example of what you might do with LIDAR data. Um, I'm not going to explain this too much other than to say here's a raw waveform. I've smoothed it out. There's algorithms called watershed segmentation. So effectively, that's looking for the peaks and then kind of separating them into different objects. So you can imagine if you flip this upside down and you filled it with water, that explains kind of the watershed concept of, you know, the different sections would be different watersheds. And then what I've done is taking the peak of the first return, I just calculated the rise time. So from the left to the peak, fall time, peak to maybe some fraction of energy that could be where it ends. And now I've gone and done that for several laser pulses and colorized a point cloud based on that fall time. So in this case, blue and purple is going to be a very short fall time. So you can see the bare earth and ground come out blue. Some of the pine plantation tends to have more of that structure as a function of time. So it'll come out oranges and reds. So one of the challenges here is, you know, on this map, you might say, oh, well, I can see the pine plantation. This is an easy land cover classification. But you can see there's red speckled throughout probably what are oak trees here as deciduous. Um, so maybe you have more yellows and reds here, but it might not be as straightforward to just make a land cover map, but just something to think about of what you might be able to do with waveform. And then just finally, what a lot of the universities that are working with waveform, they tend to do this thing called deconvolution. So the idea is, once again, you have that outgoing pulse that blurs the data. And essentially, deconvolution, they're just trying to sharpen that up and see what this underlying structure might really look like. So this is just a basic example of one algorithm called Richardson-Lucy. You can see the raw waveform kind of looks like this. Uh, as you start to deconvolve, it actually turns more into a Gaussian shape. And then here now, you kind of see three features. And as you keep going, it says, well, there's really two objects here, and then there's two over here. Now, one of the challenges with this is 
is any of this real? So a lot of times people might end up doing an intensity threshold. Um, so in some, I think I ran this kind of like the plot you just saw with the fall time. And sometimes like with these points, you'll actually end up getting noise above and below the ground. And when you look at that, you say, well, this isn't even realistic. It's just an artifact of this algorithm. So, you know, it's kind of like buyer beware with some of these algorithms that if you don't totally know what they're doing and you overprocess, it might not be realistic. So, I mean, there's a lot of research going on with simulations and doing ray tracing in kind of a 3D CAD world to sort of understand if this is real or not. And then finally, this is an example from Tan Zhu at Texas A&M, but he's just done some different processing levels and presented this nice figure. So you have your discrete return up top. If you were just to take those full waveforms and kind of put them in a 3D land, they'd be very blurry and confusing. Um, but he's analyzed them through just um, fitting Gaussians to that raw waveform or running two different deconvolution approaches. And really the hope with the deconvolution is if those objects that we saw on the previous slide were real, you might be able to get more of a densified point cloud than you could with the discrete data because hopefully the waveform is picking up some of those objects that were lost. And with that, I will leave it to questions.